In our next lesson from Chapter 3, From Genes to Proteins, we'll briefly review in this lesson the subject of genomes. In this table from your book, we're comparing the number of genes and genome size with organism, and we find that the number of genes only roughly relates to the complexity of the organism. If we compare Homo sapiens, here in our blue box, with that of the nematode worm C. elegans in our green box, we find that the number of genes for humans is only slightly more than the worm, and yet there's quite a difference in the organisms. And so clearly the complexity must also be a factor of gene expression, that is how those genes are expressed. If instead we look at genome size, we find that we have 32 times the amount of DNA that, than the worm. And so therefore genome size would be a better measure of the complexity of the organism. With regard to coding and non-coding DNA, we find that prokaryotes have all but a few percent of their DNA that are expressed as genes. That is, these are genes that are transcribed into RNA and translated into protein, or genes that are transcribed and function at the level of the RNA. In other words, there's very little extraneous DNA. In the case of eukaryotes, there's a higher proportion of non-coding DNA, and this seems to increase with the complexity of the organism. Only about 2% of our genome actually codes for protein, whereas about 80% is transcribed and functions at the level of the RNA but is not translated to protein. If we look at the human genome in this figure from your book, we find the presence of repetitive sequences. So in our pie chart, the little small yellow wedge represents the portion of the DNA that codes for protein. There's also a larger proportion that are highly repetitive DNA sequences a good proportion that are moderately repetitive, and some have unique sequences. These repetitive sequences arise from these transposable elements, or transposons, also called jumping genes. These are segments of DNA that are copied and pasted multiple times, and so we find these repetitive sequences. Some of these sequences code for RNA, and some do not. Once we have the sequence of the genome, how do ident we identify potential genes? There are two ways. The first is to look for an open reading frame, or ORF. So in our figure here, if we look on the bottom left, we have our two strands of DNA, one in our bracket of green, the other in our bracket of red. And because we have a triplet codon, we could start at the first nucleotide, and we have a sequence of triplet codons that specifies a sequence of amino acids. If we shift that by one nucleotide, that's our plus two strand, now we have a different sequence of codons and therefore a different sequence of am amino acids. We can shift that one more position and we have yet a third reading frame. So there are three possible reading frames in each of the two strands and they differ by one nucleotide. So in this case, we'll put our DNA sequence into the computer. It will scan that sequence and look for translational start codons. Remember, the start codon is universal. In DNA, that would be ATG. And it looks for stop codons as well. This would be a potential gene. However, it looks for the longest open reading frame. In the example here, if we look at frame 1, highlighted in blue is a sequence that represents the longest open reading frame, and so that's a potential gene because there's enough of a sequence to code for a functional protein. However, in frame 2, we it highlighted in red, we see a very short sequence here, not a functional protein, uh, at least not likely to be. We find, though, if we do this particular method, we often get an overestimate of the number of genes. All this represents is a potential gene. The only way we can determine whether or not it's actually expressed is by experiment. The other method that we could use is to institute a sequence comparison. So we take our sequence of our known gene and we're going to compare that to genomes of other organisms. In the sequence alignment that we're looking at here at the bottom of the screen, we have the XOS gene from ch chicken, human, and mouse, and this is an alignment of the amino acid sequence, and you can see they're very similar. So if we institute this kind of a comparison and we find a similar gene in a different organism, likely they have the same function. This restricts us, though, because it requires that that gene has been sequenced in at least one other organism, and so there's a tendency to underestimate the number of genes in this case.
Now that we have our gene sequence and the number of genes that are there, we can do a placement. We can do a genome map where we show the placement and ori orientation of genes on the chromosome. Remember, transcription and translation run 5' prime to 3'. Prime. This is illustrated at the bottom of the screen. These block arrows indicate the direction of transcription and translation, so they point from the 5' prime to the 3' prime end. Now in part A, this is a 10 kilobase section of the E. coli genome, and you can see there's very little wasted space. Most is transcribed and translated into protein. In contrast, we have a larger segment, about 2500 KB of a mouse genome, but even in this comparison you can see the gene segments are short and there are large regions that don't code for any protein. So what's the difference? Well, in mammalian genes, recall, they're spliced. That is to say, the DNA is transcribed into RNA, and the RNA molecule is spliced so that the final product is much smaller. These larger regions that are spaces in the DNA are spliced out. What can we learn by knowing the genome of a particular organism? Well, if it's a pathogen, for instance, and we know the metabolism of that pathogen, we can devise a drug that will kill that pathogen, and that will help us to fight those infections. Another example would be to institute a genome comparison between different species. For instance, we have a circular genome map of the human genome on the upper left, and on the right, Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly, and the identical genes, that is those in the same gene family, are of the same color. And you can see by this comparison that they share many of the same genes. If we find the gene in a target organism, that is a model organism, and if we can mutate that gene and discover its function, then we can extrapolate, extrapolate that to the human system. This is an example of how we discovered the function of the cystic fibrosis gene by this kind of sequence comparison. We can also, by this method, identify disease markers. Many times diseases involve mutations in multiple genes, and so we can compile a database of what are, of what are referred to as single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. These are differences in DNA sequences among individuals, and especially individuals who have that disease. We can look for patterns and perhaps identify marker genes that will help us to identify and treat those diseases. We still have one section left to consider in Chapter 3, Section 3.4 on DNA techniques. However, we're going to return to this later. In our next video lesson, we're going to begin our studies in Chapter 20 with a brief review of DNA structure.